In this video, we're going to be discussing fatigue and creep. And what we're going to be looking at in particular is how we can estimate fatigue and creep life, or the time to fatigue rupture and the time to creep rupture. Now we have already discussed this, but we're going to take it a little bit further and look at actually making some predictions for different materials. Now the first important thing to point out is that the scale on our x-axis, which is cycles to failure, is actually a logarithmic scale. So we go from 10 to the 3, which is 1,000, to 10 to the 4, which is 10,000, and so on along our x-axis. Whereas on our y-axis we have a linear scale, where we go from stresses of 100 to 200 to 300 megapascals and so on. Now it's important to note with fatigue that that stress amplitude in megapascals must be below the failure stress of the material. So let's take a couple of examples. Let's begin with a stress amplitude of 400 megapascals and we're going to be looking at 1045 steel, which is the top of the three lines on our graph. Now, if we wanted to estimate how many cycles 1045 steel could tolerate at 400 megapascals, then we would go to our y-axis, 400 megapascals, and we would track right until we strike our line for 1045 steel. Now, from there, we would need to track downwards until we meet our x-axis. And what we can see in this example is that a stress amplitude of 400 megapascals, which must be below the failure stress of 1045 steel, our material can tolerate 10 to the 5 cycles before rupture. Well, 10 to the 5 is the same as 1 times 10 to the 5. And 1 times 10 to the 5 is 1 with 5 zeros on the end. So in actual fact, it's going to be 100,000 cycles to failure. Now, if we had a stress amplitude of 400 megapascals, then it should be apparent that red brass would not be suitable. 400 megapascals must be above the failure stress of red brass. However, if we had a more modest stress of 100 megapascals, again, we would go to 100 megapascals on our y-axis. We would track right until we meet our line. We would track downwards until we cut the x-axis. And there we can see we have a number of cycles somewhere between 10 to the 6, or a million, and 10 to the 7 of 10 million. Now, if we wanted a more accurate representation of that value, then we would need to add minor grid lines to our x-axis. So what this shows is that providing we have an accurate SN diagram, or stress to number of cycles diagram, for a given material, then we can predict the number of cycles to failure. We'll do one more example. This time we'll have a stress of 200 megapascals on our y-axis, and this time we're going to look at our 2014 T6 aluminium alloy, and we can see that the number of cycles to failure is 10 to the 6, or 1 million. So SN diagrams provide a very effective way for us to predict the number of cycles to failure. Now it's important to reiterate that this is only a prediction. Any flaws or defects in the material could dramatically reduce fatigue life. Now we also looked at some examples of creep, and one of the important things that we noticed when we discussed creep was the impact that temperature can have on the time to rupture. Now all of the lines on this graph represent the same material, low carbon nickel alloy, but the big difference here is that the temperature at each line differs. So we have a line for 649 degrees C, a line for 538, and a line for 427 degrees C. And if we take a stress of, say, 50 megapascals on our y-axis, then we can see at 649 degrees C, the component is likely to rupture in 10 to the 3 hours, or 1,000 hours. Whereas if we reduce the temperature, to 538 degrees C, still using 50 megapascals, then now we can see the component is likely to last 10 to the 5 hours, or 100,000 hours. So the lifetime has increased a hundredfold. If we think of that in reverse, we may have a component that we want to last 100,000 hours, or 10 to the 5 hours. And we may know that our working temperature is 538 degrees C. 
Therefore, we know that our stress should not exceed 50 megapascals. However, imagine the impact if the temperature increases even slightly up towards 649 degrees C. Then we can see that the impact of that is going to be a dramatic reduction in the rupture lifetime. So temperature has such a huge impact. Now the problem with the graph that we see there is it's only specific to three different temperatures. And instead what we need is a more robust method of predicting lifetime at any stress and any temperature. So now we can introduce something called the Larson-Miller parameter. And here we have an example of a Larson-Miller parameter graph for a specific alloy, S590 alloy. Now S590 alloy is a steel that's specifically designed for high temperature applications. And as we've just seen, temperature has a huge impact on rupture lifetime. So let's take an example of how this would be used. So let's begin by saying we have a stress of 400 megapascals. Note that our y-axis has the stress, but we have a logarithmic scale. So we go from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400 megapascals. And at 400 megapascals, we can use the graph to determine our Larson-Miller parameter. So we're going to track right. When we strike the graph, we track downwards, and I've deliberately chosen 400 megapascals because we get a nice round 20 for our Larson-Miller parameter. Now for Larson-Miller parameter, there's a specific formula, and it's as follows. LMP equals the temperature in Kelvin, 20 plus log of the time, all divided by 1000. Now just to explain this a bit further, we know that the temperature T needs to be in Kelvin because the LMP from the chart is given in Kelvin hours. We can see that from the units. Therefore, we know that the temperature needs to be in Kelvin and we need to know the time over here in log T, the time needs to be expressed in hours. The reason why we're dividing by a thousand is because again from our graph, LMP is times 10 to the three. So that value of 20 is in effect 20,000. So let's do that as our first modification. If we multiply each side of our equation by a thousand, then we'll get 20, which was our value of LMP, times a thousand gives us 20,000. T, 20, plus log t. Now it's important to note this value 20 inside the bracket is just a constant and it's a constant depending on the material. So for the purpose of this activity, we're going to assume that that constant is always 20. So the 20 here inside the brackets remains unchanged. Now what we can see here is that we have two variables and we can choose a value for either one of those variables and determine the other. So let's say, for example, and we use this as example A, we want our component to last 100,000 hours. And so we want to know the maximum working temperature. Well, to get T on its own in our formula, all we need to do is divide by the bracket. So we'll get T equals the 20,000 divided by the bracket, 20 plus log, and our time in hours is 100,000. Now running that through the calculator, we get a temperature in Kelvin equal to 800 Kelvin. which is the same as 527 degrees C. 
Now we know that if we increase the temperature, then the service life is going to decrease. But let's say this time the temperature is increasing to 650 degrees C. Well, the first thing we need to do is to convert that to Kelvin. So adding 273, we get 923 Kelvin. We then need to take our equation, and this time we're trying to find lowercase t. So the first thing we need to do is isolate that bracket by dividing each side by uppercase t. Well, we've got 20,000 as our left-hand side, dividing by the temperature in Kelvin of 923, and that will leave our bracket of 20 plus log lowercase t. Now, as we're trying to get lowercase t on its own, the next thing we need to do is minus 20 from each side. So we'll get log t equals 20,000 divided by 923 minus 20. Now, I'm just going to simplify that before we carry out the next step. And I get an answer of 1.6685. to four decimal places. Now hopefully you recall the inverse of log t, where log t is actually log to the base 10 of t, but the inverse is 10 to the power of. So if we take 10 to the power of log to base 10 of t, we'll just be left with t. And if we take 10 to the power of our right hand side, we'll get 10 to the power of 1.6685. Now that value equals 46.6 hours. So once again, what we see is a very small increase in temperature leads to a dramatic reduction in the amount of time the stress can be held for before rupture. Okay, let's take a look at one final example. And this time we're going to work in the opposite order. So this time, I'm going to specify that I have a much higher temperature, this time of 1000 degrees C, which is 1273 Kelvin. So let's say for the purpose of this example that our component's going to be held under tension at these very high temperatures for two days. Well, the first thing that we need to do is convert days into hours by timesing by 24. So two days is the same as 48 hours. And now we have our temperature and our time in the correct units, we can now go on and calculate our LMP. And our formula, if you recall, was T, 20 plus log lowercase t, divided by 1000. And plugging in values, we get 1273, our temperature, 20, plus log of our time in hours, 48, all divided by 1,000. Now when we run that through the calculator, we get a value of LMP equal to 27.6. So we have... 27.6. Now we have our value for LMP, we can determine the maximum allowable stress that will allow our component to be held for two days at a temperature of 1273 under tension. Now 27.6 on our x-axis, we have 26, 27, 27.6 is going to be somewhere around here. So we can see in terms of our curve, we're striking very close to the end of our curve here. From there, we need to track across to the left. Now, if we look at our stresses, these go up in tens because it's a log scale. So we've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So as an approximation, the allowable stress here is going to be somewhere in the low 40s. Recall that this is a logarithmic scale, so probably around 42 megapascals. And so although this is a relatively high strength steel, 
The fact that it's being held under tension for a prolonged period at an elevated temperature of 1000 degrees C, it's only capable of withstanding 42 megapascals.